Oh yeah, nice. Oh yeah. Nice, nice. What were you saying, bro? Bro, the minute that you send that, literally, I've just pressed go live. <laughs> What's up, Josh? What's up, 13 BTR? My guys are back. My guys are back. How's it going, guys? Good to see ya, good to see ya. Honestly, it feels great. It feels like home. If I jump on live and it's like all the, all the names I recognize. Oh, okay, let me just tell this guy. No problem, comma. You don't need to leave it on charge, comma. Tomorrow. When I am ready, comma, I will let you know and you can send me the fresh codes, full stop. Best not to leave it on charge and leave the screen on all night. What's up, Godfrey? You're loud and clear on stream. Red Dog, love the content. I'm glad you're enjoying it, buddy. That's uh, what we like to see. So, what we got on the bench tonight? Whew. What is this? Playing our cards tight. What's up, Brian? Guy, buddy. Uh, I've got a few things on the bench today. Um, I want to actually to ask the more experienced among you. I need I need a modern day equivalent of the of this. Can anyone tell me the modern day equivalent of the TL712? Basically, I need one of these for my base 15k rebuild, but they're few and far between. And I've kind of been looking at just briefly at various different comparators, LM211, 311, 393, etc. Uh, but I can't find anything that has the same pin out. Um, yes, Godfrey, you kind of are out on the money. So basically on the bench we have a Tyrant's Pace 15k, and this is the one that I would like to get up and running. This is a beast. This is a freaking monster. Look at that Transformer! This is a chonky. So, I have ordered, or am ordering, all new power supply fetch for this bad boy. Um, so this needs quite a lot of work. This has been used as a donor board for years in my loft, in my attic. But I did manage to get a heatsink for it, so now I want to rebuild it. Um, so, I will take you through what this needs. This needs new power supply filter capacitor. There's, mm, that one's wobbly. Yeah, new power supply filter caps, needs new drive ICs, needs new gate resistors, needs new power supply MOSFETs, obviously. A couple of capacitors, possibly, a couple of resistors in the power supply section here. It needs new auxiliary supply transistors, BC, what is it, B something, C uh, 56 and 53, go there and there, that's fine. Then, the output section, Ooh, it's quite a few bits missing from the output section. We need new drive ICs, uh, new IGBTs, obviously, in the output side. Uh, a couple of 15 volt zeners. We need um, a bunch of 072C, as you know, this one's actually loaded with 072Cs, but they look like they've been replaced in the past. Um, so I might fit all new ones, because they're kind of critical to the class D operation here. Um, there's a bunch of resistors missing, a bunch of service mount resistors that are all missing. There's one here, for example, I think that's a 10R. Um, a couple of, a couple of thousand. We're missing the MCU, but I do have a replacement MCU for this, so that is fantastic. Um, but the one thing that I can't find a replacement for is this, right here. Um, that is a TL712C, and um, I've done a little. I've done like ten minutes of googling and comparing data sheets, but I can't find a replacement. And this is the original data sheet. So as you can see, the pinout is um, two and three is input. 4 is OE, whatever the freaking heck that is. I don't know. I, I've never looked at the data sheet of one of these before in my life. Um, so I don't know what OE is doing. Output enable. Oh, okay. So that's like a shutdown pin. I right, know, Rose. Um, VCC is on pin 8. It uses a single positive supply. And then out on 6 and 7, ground on pin 5. That's what we need. Thanks, Godfrey. Yeah, got there in the end. Output enable. Output enable. So that's what we need. I need something that has the same pinout and functionality as that because you can't get them anymore. 
I've done a little bit of googling but I can't seem to find anything easily so I just wondered whether any of you bright minds might have any ideas for a suitable alternative to save me hours of searching data sheets um, hi hi Lowry how's it going you're usually first it'll slack in a little bit um, hello from NZ at 6 30 a.m. Sheesh, it's crazy the time difference, isn't it? Imagine it being 6 30 in the morning right now. Man, just, I just had my dinner, I'm chilling. It's a nice, cozy evening here. Uh, good luck with the repairs. Thank you very much, Craig. Appreciate you, buddy. I bought some blown sundown 1500.1 amps that are blown, needing repairs. I bought more and repaired all of them. Freaking good job, Josh. Man, that's sick, isn't it? That's fucking, that's well satisfying, that is. <laughs> Uh, pretty old, are they, are they the old ones, the old circuits? Um, I think the ancient ones used to use P-channel FETs in the output side as well. But uh, yeah, if anyone's got any ideas um, of, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just do this real quick. Uh, where's my BRB? Here we go. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not in loft. Um, I, I just, I'm just going to do this. Needed. TL712C modern alternative and then anyone that's jumping on the stream hopefully might see that and um, oops then might be able to chime in with some advice there we go Yay. Uh, so, yeah, um, I'm not sure whether to do this because obviously this 15k needs a bunch of parts. Um, so I can I can solder some parts in now while we're here, I suppose, but uh, it does need new uh, power supply fets, um, which I, I need to order. Uh, but I suppose we can load up the rest of the parts into here while we're at it. So I've got the, uh, the new MCU um, and uh, I've got drive ICs for this. I don't have auxiliary supply transistors, so we can wait for those to arrive. Uh, I can swap around some parts from the HD10Ks that here I've got as donors, but I've also actually got a HD10K case, so I would like to rebuild one 15K and one 10K. Um, I don't think I have end plates for them though, which is kind of annoying. Um, I actually got Terams to send me over some heat sinks, they were very kind to do that, but I, I forgot to ask. I need the, I need the end plates as well, so I, I might have to 3D print some end plates. It's not ideal than being plastic, but we'll see. Uh, my smart 5k popped while I was I was idling in a parking lot just barely audible volume that sucks honestly that is actually how most amps fail rarely over here of amps failing when they're like heavily under load it's always when the music's on low or just on startup or just idling really frustrating um, if it's one of the early smart fives um, is it, wait, did you say it was a smart? Yeah, smart. If it's one of the earlier ones, then they had a weak point with the um, output inductors. So if you want, send me a picture, take the back off and send me a picture of the output inductors to facebook.com forward slash bearmids. And I'll have a look and see if it's one of the ones with the, uh, the weak inductors where they have issues with vibration damage against the main board. Um, if so, then yeah, you might have a fair bit of drive circuit damage and obviously output fetch you need to replace. Maybe it took the power supply down as well, but you also need to isolate the short on the output inductor. Really annoying. They have fixed that now. Um, the later ones coming out, I do believe, um, don't have that issue. But uh, yeah, kind of annoying, unfortunately, kind of annoying. But I think that was one of the things I picked up in my review of the Smart 5 originally on YouTube. I think I picked that up. And I was like, hey guys, you got to sort this out. And I think they did. I think they did. They're great guys, Tarams. They're honestly, fantastic guys. And they listen to user feedback. And they uh, are willing to help out, um, you know, amateur level technicians. Um, they're, they're really, really great guys. So, can't really knock them. But yeah, you would have thought that most amps would fail when being driven hard. That's like, you know, you think, oh yeah, driving it hard. Similar with cars, like, you know, you'd have thought, yeah, if I can, you know, drop the clutch on it and, and boost it up and that's when the engine gives out. But um, with amps, with Class D amps uh, especially, it's not the case. They always just tend to die doing nothing and it's like, eh? But um, when you understand how Class D works, it kind of makes sense because any tiny issue in the drive circuit 
or any tiny short on the inductor or anything like that and, and basically the whole thing just melts down because um, with class D at all times there is very very high voltage high frequency oscillation going on inside so if anything interrupts that then yeah it can cause a pretty bad meltdown so what I'm doing here is just um, tinning fresh tinning all of the solder pads of you know resistors and stuff that I've stolen in the past to uh, to, to use for other repairs um, getting prepared to uh, drop new parts in these. Has anyone, has anyone here ever seen, had on the bench or used a HD15K? I would be curious to know if you have. Missing a uh, missing a voltage reg over here as well by the looks of it. A voltage reg. Yeah, I wonder what that was. I don't actually have a schematic for the uh, HD15K. So if anyone has a schematic for the HD15K as well, that would be that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm sure Taramps would actually be willing to to give me one, but um, I, I like to try and avoid bugging them as much as possible. <laughs> Okay, uh, anything else that the output section needs then? So, covered that resistor there, bits around here, that resistor that's missing there, I've got a capacitor missing there. Uh, that is a voltage reg. Looks like that's going to be the same on the other side. Uh, oh, there's a couple of bits and pieces over here, actually. Got a resistor here by the looks of it. Probably a 4R7 going by that one there. That's probably auxiliary supply stuff. C6 might be missing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, does do the HD series have the little the little screen underneath? Let's have a look. I can't remember if they do. No, they don't. The HD series don't have the screen on the underside like some of the others do. So that's fine. No worries. Well, at least this one doesn't anyway. Looks like there's a header for it there though. It could could have a screen at some point if they wanted to add one. Hello Latvian video. Uh, what's your views on the HD series bro? bro? They're kind of rough and ready. Um, they, are, they don't have the most headroom in terms of current. Um, so if you're using a HD series, keep it at its nominal rated impedance. Unless you're me and you're running digital design Z4s in a really large enclosure where you've got a bunch of impedance rise. Uh, I can get away with running the HD 10k at 0.5 all the time but that's just because I know that my impedance rise is absolutely monstrous um, but uh, yeah generally you want to keep the HD series at the nominal impedance but if you do they're fine. The filter networks on them are not great for subwoofers however so you're going to need active low pass filter to make them sound half decent but um, you know that's that's fine at the end of the day these these amps are basically an amplifier they're not a they're not a processor. They're not a they're not really a crossover. They're just an amplifier, so they will sound as good as whatever you feed them. And um, I think the issue is most people are used to just relying on the filters and, and stuff in amplifiers to kind of get them the sound that they want. And therefore, there's this kind of connotation that the uh, Terrams HD series amps don't sound great, and it's just because they've not been used right. They've just been you know they're just very raw they're very raw amplifiers um, but they will amplify whatever you tell them to that's the whole point of an amplifier they am amplify whatever you tell them to amplify so um, now this amp is using the one ohm gate resistors and the FETs I'm gonna load in place I think will be fine with 4R7 so I'm actually gonna get rid of all of the one ohm gates here uh, we're going to put four R7s in place. I think one ohm is a little bit low for the effects we're going to load in here. Uh, the original power supply FETs in these amps are absolutely monstrous. They are IRFP, sorry, RF, yeah, IRFP 
four 004s. I'm going to go look up the data sheets, one of those if you like. Um, they're pretty monstrous FETs. Um, yeah, pretty pretty awesome FETs those. And uh, stupidly, I forgot how awesome they were. <laughs> and I, uh, I fitted, I had a bunch of spares of the 1404s and I fitted them to a Korean half bridge. So I, I know which Korean half bridge they're fitted to. They're fitted to an LW Audio um, 4500. So that amplifier, provided there's headroom in the transformer, uh, would be good for like 0.5 all day long. Um, I think I think I upgraded the output fets as well. Yeah, I did. I upgraded the output fets in that one as well. Uh, it's just because I had them laying around. So it was for a mate, and I, I had parts in stock laying around that were just the right number of fets for that amp. And I was like, oh, the chances of me like you know being able to use these for something else that's just the exact right number with the exact with the sort of the right specs is kind of low. So I thought, oh, I might as well use them in this LW. And uh, my guy got an upgrade as a result. Oh, there's a little surface mount cap here as well missing, but that's probably not super critical. We can just drop in a 10 microfarad or something in there. It just looks like a VCC butt filter cap. Uh, yeah, a couple of, there's a resistor here. I don't actually think these resistors were ever fitted because there's no resistor in any for any of those four locations and the uh, soldering looks factory on the pads there. So yeah, I think we covered everything over there on the power supply. Now we've just got these uh, auxiliary supply voltage transistors, which I've got some on order for. So yeah, we won't be able to get this one running this evening, but I just thought I would start the process of um, swapping parts in, getting it running, getting bits of it working so that we can uh, then more quickly sort it out once my parts arrive for it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Larry says, what you suggest? Uh, now I have a ported sub box, but I need a slightly narrower box. Uh, the box can be longer and higher. Rebuild box, uh, want better low frequency response too. Now I don't know which box design is better to use. Just go for a ported, dude. It's, it's, it's nice and easy. Um, you've got a bit of room for error in there as well, and it can still sound fine. Um, so yeah, just redesign it with the... Um, with the pro, you know, with the dimensions that you need. Um, yeah, I don't know what you were tuned to before, but 28 is always a nice place to be. I find I, I quite like a 28 hertz tuning. It plays low enough for most stuff, and um, still has some good punch on the higher stuff if you tune, if you design it right. And Gary says I have an integrated hi-fi amp that has four any 5534s in the phono section. The ground is being pulled down to negative 16 volts. When you say the ground is being pulled down, um, so if you're if you're measuring negative sixteen on somewhere that should be ground, um, that's not the ground being pulled down as such. That just means that there is a ground reference missing. So the the ground the ground that you're measuring from should be connected to either the power supply ground or main ground or something somehow either directly connected you know just with a straight connection or with like a 1k resistor plus a parallel capacitor or something like that. Um, so you may find that there is a ground reference missing and you I like I don't know the amplifier that you're referencing and I I, I don't want to advise you do something that may cause more damage but whenever I've got a voltage on something that should be ground, um, then I tie that directly to my main ground, my power supply ground, um, and that then gives the correct ground reference and I can see if the circuit starts behaving as it should. Um, but yeah, I don't know your amplifier and obviously you need a current limited supply to do that. So yeah, difficult one that. 
Mausa shows a lot of the uh, TL712 CD on First Search. I don't use Mausa because they're not UK based. I have to pay a lot of money to import stuff from Mausa and I have to wait a long time for shipping. So basically I'm after a modern alternative that is readily currently available and being manufactured that I can buy from one of my suppliers in the UK, either RS Components, Farnell, Mercatio, etc. Um, yeah, even though Mouser might have some, um, there's I don't think there's any supplies here in the UK that have any. Although I haven't tried Farnell, I'll give Farnell a quick a quick go. Um, TL seven twelve. <coughs> nah, nothing, nothing at all. So yeah. Timbo, uh, TL712 CDR or CP? Um, good question. I do have one uh, on this HD 10K board. It's right here. So let's have a look and see what it says. That's a bit far, Bearbids. It literally just says TL712C. Um, so I guess either is fine. Don't know. I haven't looked at the data sheet enough to determine the differences, so. Oh, typo grandmister says found LM360. Uh, but it's quite a bit slower. Hmm. It depends on what it's doing here in this circuit. If it's like doing class D stuff, then that might be a problem. Although the oscillation frequency, the class D switching frequency of these amplifiers probably isn't that fast, so it might work. It's worth a try. If you found one that has the same pinout, thank you very much. Let's give that a quick a quick look and compare. Um, so Ah, not the same unfortunately, buddy. So the 712 has a single positive uh, supply voltage. Um up to 5.5 volts, yeah, 5 volt supply, whereas the 360 requires by the looks of it, although maybe not, maybe we could just make that be 0 volts, it looks like it replies a tracking supply, operates from a single 5 volt supply, uh, whereas this one, positive voltage supply, yeah, see it needs plus minus 8, oh no, that's the absolute maximum, what's the minimum, or the uh, the recommended? Um, differential input voltage plus minus five. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, we need something that just takes a single positive supply of five volts. But uh, thanks for that. That was almost right. All the other pins looked looked about right, and the pinout actually looks kind of kind of the same. If the negative supply would work as ground with uh, with only five volts, that would be plus minus two point five volts. I don't think that's going to work. How's it going, Zach? Uh, there is THS four one one five. All right, but the footprints don't match. Maybe I'll just have to order from Elsa then. Uh, fully differential, low noise precision. Yeah, yeah, we need the pin out to match. Unfortunately. Digikey and Mouser, again, like I say, they're not, um, not UK based. Mouser are based in High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire. Why is it then, every time I've ordered from Mouser, I've had to pay a million pounds in bloody shipping? Right, let's have a look on Mouser then. I, I, I literally never consider Mouser because every single time I've needed to order something from them, I've had to pay lots of money in shipping or import tax duty fees. Right. Right. 
What are the differences between these? Are they just packaging differences? Yeah, cut, tape, mouse reel or tube. That's just going to be the differences in these parts by the looks of it. Um, so yeah, let's just go for like three of these probably. So let's see whether we get hit with crazy shipping. Yeah, look, international priority is what I'm talking about. Why am I a man's paying £12 international priority? So they're not, ba then these parts aren't in the UK. I don't want to pay you £16 for three fucking comparators. I'm sure I can find a modern alternative that has the same pin out. Um, that's going to cost me like £2.50. That's, that's the issue. I don't want to pay twelve pounds. Like twelve pounds is a lot of parts that I could be spending on parts. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I will pay it obviously if there's no alternative, but I'm sure that there is a, a, a compatible alternative. Yeah, they couldn't use a standard LM339. I know, it's freaking annoying. I'm sure I could patch something else in to make it work, but I just want to use... I don't want to have to do any extra work that I don't need to do, you know what I mean? Select a different shipping option. All right, let's have a look. don't think there is any other shipping options, are there? More delivery options, let's see. What have we got? Uh, UPS Worldwide. There's no price on that one. Bill recipient, it'll be whatever it costs. Duty customs back collected at time of delivery. They're all more expensive. So yeah, this this is this is the problem. It's all coming from overseas. I don't want to buy something from overseas. Check the TLC. Tender love and care. 372 MP. Alright, let's have a quick look at that then, my man. Thank you very much for that, Andy. I'm gonna call you Andy just because that's the readable bit of your name. Ah, here we go. Wait, no, is that? Ah, so close. Ah, uh, nah, yeah, it's it's close, but not quite there. It, this, for some reason, yeah, the the TL712 has positive negative in and positive negative out, whereas most of these comparators have positive negative in for each side and then a single out for each side. Whereas that's not what this has. The uh, this is a bit of a weird comparator that I haven't really seen before in terms of its like pin out. Close, but not quite. Uh, another carbonized amplifier? No, not 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 this time. This one's fine. But yeah, so until then, until I find the part that I need, uh, we can just load up the rest of the bits in here. So. Um, MCU first, I think. Start with the MCU. Uh, so that's pretty important. Now, where's my HD 15K MCU? There it is. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff.
I also actually could do with a schematic for the uh, HD 15K. So if anyone has a schematic for the HD 15K, give me a shout. If not, I'm sure I can probably get one from Taram. So pretty pretty good with that sort of thing. This is an older amplifier now, so I don't think they care too much about it, you know it being cloned or whatever. The position of this one's a little bit, little bit poor, but um, it's fine. It's on all the pads. That's all that matters. Okay, cool, cool. Have you tried ChatGPT? I did actually consider that. Um, maybe I'll bring, maybe I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up. Chat.OpenAI. Let's check it out. Okay, uh, let's have a look and see what it suggests. Can you suggest a pin compatible replacement, modern replacement for the TR7 Prop C? It is a different. Why do I say thanks? It literally doesn't care. Ronnie says, I have an amp that shows 18 volts by 12 volt supply. Uh, do you know what the problem is? I don't understand your question, I'm afraid, buddy. Can you rephrase it? What do you mean by it shows 18 volts by 12 volt supply? I'm not sure what you mean. It's broken. I've I've broken it. It doesn't know. At the amp terminals, which terminals? Power supply terminals or output terminals? Like you can't have 18 volts at the power supply terminals with 12 volts going in. That wouldn't make any sense. So got our MCU fitted, nice. Um, we need, I think that's going to be a 1K resistor there, going by the HD10K. Now I've got, like I said, I've got two HD10Ks here. Uh, one of them I want to rebuild, and one of them I will just use for parts. So I guess we can have a look at how bad each of them is, and which one's going to be more work to rebuild. So this one's missing an output inductor, no biggie replace that no problem um, that just needs the diode resoldering on the back there uh, but otherwise the board looks in pretty good shape uh, we've got all the power supply caps the transformer looks all right needs new power supply and obviously power supply rebuild all the rectifiers are there although they're bent but that's fine uh, the MCU is present as well. Uh, I need some 072s in the preamp, and also we, we also need the uh, 712 on this one as well. This one needs like lots and lots of chips replacing. Needs all of these, all of the almost all the diodes replacing on the output here as well. Okay, now uh, what about this one? This one needs a couple of new rail caps, uh, but the inductors are present. Uh, it has had a pretty big meltdown on the output section. IGBT has exploded. Um, most of all of the diodes are present. Uh, it needs a overcurrent sensor replacing. No worries, got spares of those. 
It uh, looks like it has, mm, well, it has the 712C. It has some uh, some 072s, sort of roughly mounted. In terms of resistors, it needs, needs some uh, voltage regs, capacitors. Uh, that capacitor needs replacing. That trace is a little bit, a little bit mangled there as well. Uh, power supply, yeah, it needs a power supply rebuild, same as the other one. But all the caps again are present. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, which one would you go for? Would you go for this one, top or bottom? I am kind of leaning towards bottom, only because. There's less surface mount bits, I think, that needs need swapping out. If the more I look at this one, the more surface mount stuff I see that's missing. Uh, yeah, I'm actually a little more tempted to go with this bottom one actually. Yeah, also we have the resistors here for the auxiliary supply, which we don't have. Yeah, this one definitely has more parts still on it, so I think we're gonna go for the bottom one. <laughs> and chat fixes the amp, you'd probably be okay if Ian isn't here. That is very true, he's not here. So that would go fine. Everyone would behave themselves and we'd get a fix. <laughs> right, so if I'm going to use this bottom one as the uh, working HE10K that I'm going to rebuild, that means we can use this top one here um, to steal some parts from. So, let's have a look. We need... The MCU here looks like that's going to be a uh, a 1K and a 1K there and there. So let's start getting those off. I've probably got some brand new 1Ks to be honest, but uh, fuck it. 1K and 1K. Let's get those off. I think the bottom one just looks more dirty. Um, and it also looks a bit blackened where the power supply is burnt down and I haven't cleaned it yet. Um, but um, yeah, the PCBs in both are actually fine. I need to add a little bit of flux to all of these pads that I have um, refreshed because uh, just to help them take a bit better. Sure, wish you had the knowledge in Bevid's mind. You can get it, bro. You can get it. Just gotta read Perry's guide on amplifier repair, bca1.com, and then just buy yourself some blown amps and start repairing them. That's literally all I did. You can get that same knowledge. I I'd, honestly, I don't know that much. Like, I know it looks like it might look like at times I know like loads and loads about electronics and stuff, but I really don't. I actually am like quite a beginner when it comes to general electronics. I just know a lot about problem solving and fault finding, specifically in amplifiers, and that does translate to other circuits as well. But honestly, my my general um, my general electronics knowledge is actually quite poor because I've you know I've never done any electronics um, you know courses or anything like that. I literally just jumped in a deep end. Right, let's fix some amps, and kind of just learned from doing it. Um, so the, the background knowledge is very poor. So what are we missing as well? We're missing a this is a one three three two. Oh uh, no, that one's missing there. I don't know what R twenty. I don't know what R twenty four should be. Uh, but fortunately for me, I do actually have a well. I would say fully functional HD ten K. It's not quite fully functional. <laughs> it works sometimes, and sometimes it distorts the sine wave like a proper good one. Um, so I do have a fully built HD 10K that I can take some values from if we get a little bit stuck with anything that's kind of missing here. 
because um, there is a one resistor here missing, R24, um, that's missing from every single one of my donor boards, so I don't know what it is off the top of my head at the moment. Um, there's also this one right here, um, which is C43. C43 on my 15K, which is right here, that's missing. Um, I suspect it's just a general, you know, same sort of size cap. Uh, I suspect it's probably the same cap value as this one up here. It's the same circuit as this part over here, so I'm just going to go ahead and guess it's, guess it's one of these. One of these, I'm sure it's fine. Drop it in, see what happens. Uh, Ronnie, the pianist, says... Um, oh, yes. oh yes, this is the 12 volt, 18 volt weird thing. Um, so, Ronnie, can you just confirm? You're seeing 18 volts at which terminals? Output terminals, speaker terminals, or power supply terminals. If you have a 12 volt supply connected, you won't see 18 volts at the power supply terminals because that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's not physically possible. Unless there's some problem with the amplifier where it's causing a flyback effect on the power supply transformer and it's raising the voltage of your 12 volt supply to 18 volts. And that's a little bit dangerous for your supply and a bunch of other stuff. But that would be extremely unlikely. Um, if your power supply, if your 12 volt power supply is a old fashioned linear power supply that uses a transformer inside, then yes, you might actually see 18 volts on the power supply output um, when the supply is not really loaded that much. Uh, it's a little bit dangerous using these old fashioned um, linear transformer power supplies because, uh, yeah, the, the output voltage is not kind of fixed, it's not regulated. Uh, so the supply is designed to be 12 volts or there or thereabouts 12 volts when connected to the original ap appliance that tra that um, power supply was designed for. And when you have it uh, floating or connected to something else that draws a different amount of current, then it can actually output a wide range of different voltages depending on, uh, depending on what it's connected to. So you need to be a bit careful with that. Uh, it's not better to connect to a 12 volt battery. You don't want high current available when you're diagnosing and repairing amplifiers. You want a nice low current supply, but you need something that is um, regulated, that's you know fixed at 12 volts and that's not going to fluctuate higher with, without a load um, being connected. How difficult would it be to bypass all the preamp filters in an amp? Well, run the audio signal straight from the gain pot wherever it needs to go. Uh, yeah, pretty easy, but um, you can actually do that without, well, depending on what amplifier you have. If you have an amplifier that's strappable with a master slave input, just use the slave input. That's exactly what the slave input is. You don't get gain control. That's the only slight annoyance. You can run an inline bass remote in, to give you some gain control, or just use the head unit sub-level or DSP sub-level as your gain control. But Running the slave input is literally a direct route via a buffer for the audio into the output section. It just bypasses everything. So, yeah, if your amplifier has a slave input, then you can use that to bypass everything in the amplifier and just go straight into the drive circuit, pretty much. This is a big ground trace, you can see, uh, in order to get this off, I might even need to get the big uh, 200 watt soldering iron out for this. I'm just going to leave that there for a minute while I do some chats. <coughs> uh, but yeah, you can also yeah just cut the trace and jump the wire. Uh, yeah, so Ronnie, just send me some pictures to facebook.com forward slash bevids uh, if you want to send me pictures of whatever it is you got there that you're not sure about. I have an amp that will no longer clamp on the term lab. Any idea why it would suddenly not work? Does the amplifier still work and play music the same as it did before? You're just not getting any uh, wattage readings from the term, term lab. Is that your issue?
Let's see if ChatGPT has uh, come up with any solutions yet. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Something went wrong. Let's try and regenerate. You can regen? No? Let's copy this. So I'd have to type all that again. Uh, it reads some, just not accurate. It's probably going to be um, noise on the output filter network. Not an issue. Don't worry about it. Um, unless you specifically want to clamp power with the term lab, um, it's not an issue. Chat GPT has gone down. Heck. See if we've got enough heat in that trace now for my hot air gun to, to get to load this off. Yeah, man. What even are you anyway? Seven, eight, twelve? Oh, all right. I've got loads of you. Actually, I've got loads of these. I probably didn't even. I don't need to even remove this part. I've got loads of seven, eight, twelve sitting in a bloody drawer. What am I doing? I just kind of got into the into the routine of like swapping parts from this one to the other one. But I've got, I've got loads of them in a bloody drawer. What am I doing? There we go. Uh, I was using it for competition. Could something have broken? Um, I would have a look at the output inductors. Um, potentially. Or the output filter caps, potentially. Um, there we go. 7, 8, 12. You love to see it. <laughs> 13 BTR. I'll cover the shipping from the US. Dude, that is too kind of you. That's very kind of you, man. Um, that is super, super kind of you. The only issue is that the shipping isn't the only problem. I need to rebuild this before the 19th. Uh, so if it will arrive before the 19th, then I'll go ahead with it. But if not, then I might still have to consider other, other options in the meantime. Um, but that's very kind of you, 13 BTR man. You're an absolute legend. That's 40 bucks now in the space of a couple of days you've shot my way. Thank you so much, man. Let's see what it says in terms of uh, timing then. Um, let's buy four of these. Uh, did you get the amp from Monday stream working? That, is, yes, I did. Um, sort of. So the amplifier from Monday stream. Oh, wait, what's going on? Seven? No, hang on. Four. I forgot that I'd already, um, so the amp from Monday's stream, uh, yes, I got the TL494 modification working perfectly, and I got it working with the, um, dead time control on pin 4, reference to the, um, PWM coming from the MCU, thanks to, I think it was Michael in the live chat that suggested using a NPN transistor with a uh, RC network. That worked like a dream. Um, the only problem I've got is that, do you remember at the start of that live stream, I spent bloody ages refitting the uh, power supply gate drivers? Well, I ordered those from RS Components and they're listed as non-inverting. Guess what I got? Inverting type. And I only realized that when I powered the amplifier up and all my freaking PWM was upside down. I was like, what? And I was like, oh, because you know how much of a massive pain that was with all the traces that were broken. So I've got to, I had to remove them all and I've got to do it all again. Um, so I ordered some new drive ICs that are absolutely non-inverting. And I double, 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 double checked that I always hadn't listed them wrong this time. Um, in the um, in, in terms of whether they were inverting or non-inverting, and they arrived, and they're the wrong package type. They're listed on RS as SOIC, and they arrived as MSOP, which is too small. Which, which given the given the state of the traces, I'm not even going to bother trying to patch in. So I've got to order more again, and I've got more on order, and I've checked this time that they're definitely the right inverting type, and they're definitely the right package type, and that there's no website errors. Just super frustrating. It's like been the most headache, headache amp that I've worked on, honestly, in a long time. This band of Viking. Um, psh. 
anyway, yeah, sorry, let's have a quick look at the, uh, how, how long is this going to take to arrive then? Um, orders online ship April 11th, expected arrival, oh yeah, it does look like it might arrive in time, you know. does look like it might arrive in time okay guys 13 btrx absolute legend thank you so much buddy let's 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 buy these maybe i should buy a few of them to make it worth my while and then like sell the rest of them on ebay or something i don't know what's the difference between buying like you know if i how many have i got here but one two three four i've got four terrams hds um so let's order five just to have one as a spare probably uh now is there anything else i need from from mouser because while we're ordering from Mouser anyway, I might as well um, make use of that and uh, order some bits that aren't available anywhere else. What else can I get from Mouser that I can't get from anywhere else? I might have a look to see if there's any TDA chips on Mouser that I need. Uh, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, Uh, Daniel says I have a 4 channel amp, channel 1 and 2 work perfectly even when bridge, channel 3 and 4 have poor output and sound distorted. Clean the switches! Toggle switches, give them a flick back and forward, spray my ice probe alcohol, that's the most common issue. Um, but uh, if that doesn't help, then you need to pull the back off, get your oscilloscope out, and see what the sine wave looks like, because the shape of the sine wave in a Class AB will tell you a lot about what the problem is. Mouse have burned me with 20 pounds customs, not sure if still applies. Uh, that's what I don't want to get hit with. Um, so, yeah, again, so, yeah. That, that's another issue. I'm hoping that I won't get customs on, like, freaking five comparators. Now, Tim just got my Tarams Big Boss 3 in the mail today. Nice. That reminds me, I've really got to do my video on the Big Boss 8. I've just been so busy preparing for a bunch of stuff. Uh, lots of uh, repairs that are, like, time critical because there is a big... Um, there's a round one of uh, proper droppers here in the UK uh, coming up this weekend, which I'm trying to fix the Band of Viking 15k for and, and a couple other bits. So I'm just like flat out repairs at the minute, unfortunately. Um, but yes, uh, right. Let's get this. Uh, let's get this seven eight twelve mounted. I'm going to use the iron, I think, just to heat up that ground trace because that is very high thermal mass. <laughs> Postman had a card read ready. <laughs> oh really? I've never, I don't think I've seen that. I don't think I've ever had custom stuff come where um, they've like you know taken payment on your doorstep. That's jokes. My question is, do you repair more defective amps or more user errors? So that's a good question. Are more of my repairs user error or just random component failure? Um, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, honestly, I would say random component failure. Honestly, yeah. Like you get uh, a fair bit of vibration damage. Um, I would say the number one user error is vibration damage. Um, uh, but aside from that, most most things are literally just like output fets have died for seemingly no reason. Um, so yeah, it, it does seem to be mostly mostly uh, amplifier faults. Uh, I'm going to need to get the big soldering on out. This is ridiculous. I'm, I'm going to watch. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to heat up the um, going to heat up the board. Get it preheated a bit. With the big, the big gun, we're gonna do it from underneath, uh, just because there's no components on the other side. And that will heat the ground trace. Yeah, there we go. Here's an Orion HCCA 1500.1D, worse than a Tarrant Smart Five Base. Uh, yeah, I would probably say, yeah, not quite as good. The Tyrant Smart 5 is actually bloody fantastic. Very, very good amplifier. My Helix came from the UK. Where did you buy it from? Did you buy it from Blade Ice? Because, yeah, he's based in the UK. So although they're not made in the UK, he's imported it to the UK and then exported it again. Um...
Oh, through eBay, yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. whether that's enough heat in there now to uh, make that just work into place. That's a, that's a pretty huge difference there actually just from uh, heating that a little bit and then we're going to grab the hot air gun and we're going to reheat it up again and get those smaller legs on. There we go, you love to see it. Excellent. Okay, uh, any other, while the board's hot, while the board's hot, are there any other big bits that we should remove? Um, I think I'm gonna do this little, uh, this little overcurrent sensor over here as well while the board's nice and hot. And uh, we can also suck the solder out of the IGBT holes as well. Going to refresh that those um, pads with some fresh 6040. Oh no way! The legs on this are kind of bent, kind of bent as as heck. All right, we'll have to get that soldered in this side. Uh, okay. Let's get that soldered in over here. The legs are kind of bent on this on this guy. Not going to lie. But this has been in my in my loft in my attic for about five years or something so it's been beaten up around a fair bit Uh, by the way, did the mains amp work in the end? Um, so I was working on a little sort of um, PA, PA plate amp, wasn't I? That we couldn't get, we couldn't get any oscillation on the um, FETs in the switch mode power supply section. Uh, I haven't looked at that again yet, no, to be honest. Um, so I haven't actually done any more work on that since. I do plan to, but just uh, just it's just I've just put it, put it, put it to one side for the time being. Come on, oh, I need these legs to not snap because I don't know what the heck this part is. Middle leg NC because that trace has just disappeared. That middle middle trace has just has just yoloed out of here. Is that NC that middle one? I think it is. Yeah, it is. That's good. Good. 
because, uh, yeah, I don't know what the heck that part is. That's fine. Okay, cool, cool. Now, we need a couple of new SI8244BBs, which are these guys. So let's get this original one off the board. No idea of its, of its condition or health. And I'm not uh, too interested in finding out. We just want to replace it for new. Uh, Sad says, I always catch your stream towards the end. Uh, we're not near the end. We're, we're sort of only just started, really. Yeah, this is probably like more towards the start than it is the end. Um, it's currently 8.30 p.m. Uh, in the evening here, and I'm planning on streaming till about 10.30 or 10 or 10.30. So we've still got, what is it, 8.30, 9, 10. About two hours, maybe. Two hours of electronics repairing goodness. Now, what's that? Oh, you know what? That's another TL712. There's one per side, so I need more than I thought I did. That's going to be another one as well. Yep. So, I need to adjust <laughs> adjust my order. Good job I didn't press buy already. Um, so, two, four... Um, let's, let's go for six, actually. I don't need to adjust it by that much. Let's go for six. Uh, nice, serious, nice one, man. Nice. Okay, so yeah, we need some SI two one eight four four BBs. BB. Oh wow, I've got loads of these in here. Damn! Oh no, that's 21844S. That's not the right drawer. I picked the wrong drawer. 8244BB, here we go. Here we go. Uh, do I have any new ones? Uh, these all look like they are salvaged. That one looks new. And that one is fitted previously. That one hmm, kind of looks a bit old still. That one looks new there. There we go. I'd like these to be the same batch. I, I don't know if it matters that much with drive ICs, but um, just in case there are any sort of operational tolerance differences. So that is, that is a um, 1705. That is a 1618. So slightly different batches there. I wonder if I've got fifteen Oh, there we go. There's a 1517, I think. 1517D. Yeah, there we go. There's two absolutely exactly matching ones. I think. 1517, 1517. Yeah, there we go. So we'll try those first. See how, see how we get on with those. Well, these parts, these... um. 8244BBs are what they were for a while, very expensive, um, or not in stock. 
for a long time. Uh, I do have one more drawer up here that I could have some in, but I don't think I do. I think I didn't know. I think I got them all out, see? See this? What's this in here? No. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea if the stock situation has got any better on the 8244BBs, but uh, yeah, just around COVID time and after COVID time, they were like, you, they were like very, very hard to get your hands on or and very, very expensive as well. Uh, fortunately, um, I haven't had to use too many of these. There's not that many amps that uh, use them. And those amps that do use them seem to be pretty reliable in terms of output section. Um, honestly, the, the Taramps HD line, they're the output sections that use the IGBTs are actually pretty bulletproof. Um, I've repaired lots of Taramps HD 10Ks, but it's always the power supply section that, that dies in those. The, uh, the output sections are usually like pretty rock solid. Uh, typo, I will check that for you in just a moment. Right. Okay. So Typo says if six, pin 6 is for loading, uh, then they are using it as a single ended comparator. Let's have a look. Pin 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It certainly looks like it's not connected. Let's just check on the other one. Yeah, pin 6 is uh, not connected. Um, so using it as a single ended comparator. So. Um, with that information, is there anything that I can drop in there that that means I don't have to m mix around any of the pin out that would work? If I use differential comparator for not reason, <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> That's, that's jokes. Uh, well, what we have is we do actually have a working or a, an oscillating, to some extent, HD10K uh, here in the workshop that I can um, shove on the oscilloscope so we can have a look at what kind of waveforms and stuff uh, we see on the, uh, on the uh, 712. Now, this capacitor, this 25 volt, looks like it's going to be a bit of a pain in the bottom to remove. Mm, I was going to see if there was another one anywhere that was the same kind of spec, but I don't think there is, so I'm just going to have to try and cook up that ground trace a bit.
Hello Melky, how's it going Melky? Hope you're doing well. Yay! There we go. One capacitor, sir. Uh, what else do we need while this, this board is hot? Any other caps that I'm missing? So we've got that big one there. Um, that one there is kind of fitted, but it's a bit janky, but it's fine. Got a little surface mount one over here that's, uh, that's missing. So let's just grab that while, while we're kind of on this board. What else? Uh, we need one of these diodes, I think. Are these all the same? Probably are. That resistor R24 we don't know the value of yet, but we can find out uh, once we get the um, once we get the working HD10K on the bench. Uh, we need this resistor right here. That's a random one to have uh, gone missing. That's uh, that's another 1K there by the looks of it. Let's just grab that 1K. Cool, cool, cool. That cap and the 1K. And we need a 4R7. I've got loads of those, so that's fine. This amp is starting to look more like an amp again, guys. We're making progress. Um, once this is up and running, by the way, guys, this is what's going to be used in my van. <laughs> if we can get this um, HD15K working, I'm going to use it in the van. So that's quite exciting. If we can't get this working for whatever reason, I'll use one of the HD10Ks, uh, which I, I do have one of already. Uh, but it does have a bit of a weird intermittent fault. Um, and we're probably going to have a look at that this evening, actually, just for fun. Why not? While we're here. Thing is, because it's an intermittent fault, I don't know if it's actually going to produce the fault or not. Uh, it seems to only do it when when the board is cold. So I think it's got something to do with one of the 072s in the uh, PWM generation area. So yeah, so we need a 4R7 in that slot there as well. Oh, it's cool. We can grab one of those. Tape all three of them together and mount them in a bin and have a HD <laughs> 4500. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool, wouldn't it?
All right, cool. Um, so the only things now on the output section that we need, let's have a look. The only things left that we need on the output section is obviously IGBTs. Um, but that's fine, I've got those, but I'm not gonna fit those yet because I think with, oh, we need a capacitor here. Oh yeah, I did take the capacitor off. Um, I'm just gonna heat the board a little bit here just to get some heat into the um, ground trace. Dr. Diner says, what's the difference between the 1 ohm and 2 ohm versions? Um, yeah, so uh, Melky pretty much nailed it. Um, the power supplies are the same, um, but the um, transformer on the 2 ohm version will have more turns on the secondary, or less turns on the primary, uh, and there will be a higher output voltage, higher voltage on the output section, um, and it will have a lower current ability on the output section. So yeah, it's just literally a balance of voltage and current for the given impedance. So yeah, Melky uh, is correct. Uh, I suspect, yeah, a typo is probably right as well. They probably have um, different value inductors as well, like to, you know, accommodate for the, um, the different voltage. Get a bit more um, noise on the 2 ohm version. Um, get a bit more sort of RF noise, classy switching noise, because it's just a higher switching voltage. I need a bit of flux on there, I think. There we go. Oh, that, that is so satisfying to do that. To ha having gone from being a noob, a noob um, repair technician, and not being able to to fit or remove these in one piece, to being able to make these look almost factory with no melted plastic is like so satisfying. Obviously, we need to clean up the flux to make it look factory. But yeah, that's uh, that's pretty pretty nice. So, okay, let's just have a scan of the board and uh, just check we've got everything. So we've got all the zeners and all the diodes um, on this side. Pass, uh, drive IC, reg, uh, voltage reg, we're missing this resistor R24, which we're going to find out the value for shortly. Uh, we have all of the resistors around this part here, which I believe is the shutdown circuit. Uh, that is all present. We have this great big voltage reg, which I've never seen in any other amplifier before. All of the, the stuff over here is there. These resistors are there. MCU is present. These resistors all present. Too far our sevens. Missing obviously the seven uh, twelves, but we know that. Uh, this side drive IC present. All of the gate resistors etc present. Diodes all present. Capacitors etc looks good. Let's just go to this class D generation circuit. The uh, 072Cs, I don't trust them. They look a bit like they've been replaced before um, and they're very sensitive to heat. So I might need to drop some new ones of those in, but we can see how these perform uh, just to start with. Um, I'm just gonna 
clean up this resistor a bit. The solder's got a bit too much solder on there. This looks a bit janky. I don't like how it looks, you know. This doesn't look clean. So that's fine. So yeah, again, 072s. We might need to um, might need new ones in there. Um, but yeah, all the resistors over here are okay. Again, in the preamp circuit, 072s look like they've been replaced. Um, so you might need new ones in there, but all of the resistors look present over here in the preamp circuit, which is cool. Uh, the resistors by the fans are all there as well. Power supply section, so we are missing transistors here and here, but I've got some of those on order, so that's fine. The Zeners are present, so that's good. Uh, we need gate resistors and power supply fetch, which I've got on order. I've got the power supply fetch on order, so that's fine. Um, But um, yeah, everything else, I think. Oh, and power supply caps. We need power supply filter caps. Yeah, we're missing a couple of power supply filter caps over here. So that, that's the last thing we'll do tonight, I think, on this. And then once we have got our replacement bits and pieces in, then I'll uh, load up the IGBTs and see how the oscillation's going. Yo, how's it going, 666? Uh, Sirius, what's the missing two pin through holes? I'm not sure, I'll go and have a look at that. Maybe, maybe I missed something. Okay, well this capacitor is fine, it was just a little bit loose. <laughs> so let's just uh, suck the solder from these holes, get some fresh caps going in. Yes, Melky, this amp does use IRFP4004. Those are some pretty beefy fets. Yeah, there's a lot of solder on here. Um, I'm not actually going to use 4004s. Um, I'm going to use IRFP7530s, which are similar enough. Um, I'm never going to be using this amplifier to its full potential anyway, but uh, anyway, the, the 7530s are beasts as well, and they should be more than enough um, for the power supply section in this amplifier. Uh, but I, I, do think the, um, I do think the 4W4s do have the edge though over the uh, 7530s, but if you want to check the data sheets and compare, then feel free. <laughs> Bottom of the board doubles as a solder pot. Yeah, I know. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? There's so much trace thickness and extra bar thickness. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty chunky. And it's got a lot of mass. A lot of thermal mass. Very difficult to... Um, very difficult to suck, suck holes. I have to get the, uh, the board up to temperature here. There we go. That's a bit, that's a bit better. There we go. But I mean this, this is like a really good quality PCB, like do not think, this is great. The PCB itself is really thick, so much um, trace thickness and solder and stuff. Um, I mean comparing this to some of the stuff you can buy for a lot more money, this is actually pretty nice.
Anyone else preparing dinner while watching this? <laughs> yeah, I ate my dinner earlier. What's everyone having for dinner, by the way? I'm always curious. Corned beef, I'm stuffed. I had hot pot this evening, really nice. Kebab, BLT sandwich for lunch, nice. Does anyone in the chat here have any dietary requirements? <laughs> so it was an interesting question. Do you have any weird diet? I, I met somebody um, a few weeks back that, that was allergic to mustard. Now on the surface, that doesn't sound too bad. Oh, okay, just, you just avoid mustard. Don't put mustard in your burger, you know. Pretty easy to avoid. But no, mustard is freaking everywhere. 90% of bread has mustard in it. And uh, so she was, um, yeah, she was just saying it's a freaking nightmare because you go somewhere and you say, they say, have you got any allergies? And say, yeah, mustard. And they say, oh, that's fine, we got nothing in the mustard. And then she's like, yeah, but can you just check your bread? And they go, nah, our bread ain't got mustard in it. And, they, and she's like, can you just check? And they go out back and check, and they're like, oh, so sorry. It's got mustard in it, didn't even realise. And these can be preference dietary requirements or medical dietary requirements. Sound by cloud, hello. My, my wife is allergic to wheat. There, yeah, that one sucks. Um, so, are you on the gluten-free free ting for that one? I guess. I don't know if... We, yeah, that, 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 that's a hard one. Uh, Latvian says Burger King still doesn't exist over here. You're not missing out much. It's not great. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's fine, but there's better. Uh, tonight we eat enchiladas. Nice. Mexican. Mrs. Dunner, evening fry up, nice. Soup, I had soup for lunch today. Soup's not filling. I had soup with like two pieces of like bake at home bread and I just still felt hungry in the afternoon. Never fills me up properly. Just, uh, just while we're here, I'm just uh, getting all of these sold out of these pads, might as well, while we're having some chats. It's strange how they did it, because some traces are really thin. Yeah, the traces that are really thin are the ones that don't need to carry any current, just carrying signals or, you know, high-low signals and voltages and stuff. Uh, I had a question earlier today about repairs. Your videos really helped me understand repairs and how to do them. How would you go about identifying a scratched off IC? Um, you can look at the pinout. So what you can do is you can look at what all of the pins of that IC are connecting to on the board. So obviously the easiest ones to go by first are ground. So you, first of all you see which pin is ground. Then you see which pin is connected to a voltage supply, either a regulator or some kind of supply voltage circuit. 
so you can figure out which is the, the supply voltage. Now, if the IC is like driving MOSFETs or driving something, then you can see what pins are connected to said MOSFETs or something that it's driving. So you can then work out which are the output pins of that chip. Um, and then, like, you have to sort of look at what, what, it's, what circuit it's in. So if it, like, for example, a Class D like, MOSFET driver, um, there's only really a small handful of commonly used um, Class D uh, output drive ICs in a given package. Um, so then you just look at the pinout and you look at what's connecting to what and then you compare a few data sheets look up online a few data sheets um, and uh, then you might find one that has a matching pinout and then you're like oh it's probably going to be one of those uh, and if there's a few variants um, of that same sort of pinout chip then you look at what voltages are going on on the board what the rail voltages are what the switching voltage is going to be and then you can um, kind of identify what part it's most likely to be based on all those factors All right, well, I think we've sucked all of the holes there now in this one. Damien, oh, dude, thank you very much for a four, buddy. I really appreciate that. That's a little coffee emoji, I think. Cup of tea. Cup of tea or coffee. Nice one. I could do have a cup of tea, actually. A cup of tea would be lovely right about now, but I ain't about to go down and uh, go down off, off the stream for to make a cup of tea. I need, uh, need drones to be able to bring you a cup of tea. I never used to be a tea drinker actually, I used to hate tea, but I've uh, come round to it now. In recent years, come round to a good cuppa. Cabbage and noodles, is that, a, um, is that what you had for dinner or is that a, uh, an allergy? Well, you know, you can't be allergic to just noodles, so it must have been what you had. Cabbage and noodles, that's an interesting one, though. Uh, I make a great sausage soup. Yeah, that's got a bit of substance in it, you see. That's got a bit of something in it that fills you up. Like, a tomato soup for lunch or whatever is just kind of like... Uh, it's a bit lacking. You just end up hungry like an hour later. The only food I can't eat is coconut. I love the flavour, just the texture thing. Oh, okay. I've not, I don't think I've ever tried eating like coconut as it as it is. So I don't even know what the texture would be like. But I love coconut flavour. Like I love when you have like a coconutty curry, when you you know get like a Thai curry, coconut curries and stuff. Um, I quite like uh, coconut sweet flavour stuff. Uh, I opened my own GZ amp to take a look inside and an IC was scratched off. Oh, well, if it's an amplifier, I can tell you what the IC is. Just send me a picture to uh, facebook.com forward slash bevids. That's a massive transformer. Yes, that is a massive transformer, isn't it? That's a chunky boy. I wonder if there's any headroom in this transformer. This is the uh, HD15K. I wonder if there's actually any headroom in this or not. Um, guys, guys that are technically minded that know a bit about circuit design and stuff, are there any? I I have always been of the understanding that it's there are benefits to having multiple smaller transformers all paralleled at the rectifiers rather than having one great big giant almost one like this. What are your thoughts on that? If you know if you need to make 10k from the power supply section, are you running like one or two massive ones, or are you running six or eight smaller ones? Because like a lot of the Korean amps use multiple smaller ones, but um, yeah, do you have any uh, insight on on whether there's any drawbacks, benefits to either solution? There, be interested to know your thoughts. Uh, so what are we looking at here then, capacitor-wise? This was one of the caps that came off this board, and this is a 25 volt 4700 microfarad. The ones on the 10k are, they actually look a bit bigger. Um, yeah, they're actually bigger in capacity, so I might just go ahead and, and nick a couple of these ones. Um, unless I've got any I've got any floating around in my caps. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Now let's, let's just nick a couple of these. These, these are pretty chunky boys, these. <coughs> Ah, oh, coconut kind of squeaks like cotton wool. Yeah, I would absolutely hate that as well. I hate those kind of foods where you're eating it and it's like squeaky on your teeth. Nah, I can't do that.
and that's potato soup with chicken or sausage. So yeah, so that's a soup that's got some substance. That's more of like a hot pot, I guess. You know, it's got like all these bits in it. I've been doing tea a lot, I got way into drinking too much coffee out on the boat, so trying to drink less and replace it with tea. Yeah, I mean it's still caffeine, so it's still not great. I don't actually drink any caffeine, so I drink a cup of tea, but I drink a decaf tea. Caffeine doesn't agree with me. It makes me feel like very palpitatey. It's uh, yeah, it's not a good vibe. I'm not, I'm not very, I'm not into caffeine, but I do like green tea, herbal teas, and decaf tea. I imagine it would easy, be easier to pair one or two FETs per transformer than ten. That is one of the that is one of the arguments that I had in my mind for multiple smaller trans uh, transformers. Is that generally you only have like either two or four FETs per transformer, and therefore you've got less risk of um, you know there being uh, balancing issues. Um, I mean, obviously the FETs are probably all going to do the same batch anyway, because the app's being manufactured at the same time. It's, you know, they'll have like a batch of like many thousands of FETs. Um, so it's unlikely you're going to get, you know, different batches fitted to the same board. But um, in terms of, in terms of um, power balancing to make sure that, you know, each FET is contributing equally to the power uh, as the others are, um, yeah, I don't know which, which solution is better. I did actually measure uh, the um, power balancing on a Sundown audio. I think it was a, uh, I don't know if it was like a 3K or something. I made a TikTok of it. Not everyone's on TikTok, and I don't, I don't recommend you get TikTok, really. It's not that great. It's, 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 really, it's really toxic and, and crap. But I, I am on there anyway, just because I'm trying to like do all the socials. Um, and honestly, the videos actually do, do really well on there. Um, but anyway, I did make a little TikTok about a uh, power imbalance. Um, you know, the, some MOSFETs were massively contributing more power than others in the power supply section of a Sundown. I think that used multiple smaller transformers, so I, um, I don't think that necessarily helps because if it did, then I wouldn't have had that issue. Um, and there's nothing really you can do to fix it, it's just, just what it is, you know. Do you think Sundown is overpriced? Oh yeah, of course it is. The reason that Sundown is overpriced is because uh, there's a lot of people in the chain that need to make money before it gets to you. Um, that's the problem with these kind of big American brands. Well, I say American, then none, none of their stuff's American, but they're they're an American-based company. That's that's the issue. Is um, is that the the stuff has to go through lots of lots of money-making chains before it gets to you. And therefore, you're paying a premium. Um, whereas brands like the Brazilian brands typically either sell to you direct, or they only have one person in the chain um, that uh, that needs to make money before you get it, before you get your hands on it. And typically, they'll be the same price as they're selling to you direct from, from direct anyway. So it's about the same. So yeah, um, of course, Sundown Audio is overpriced. Ground Zero overpriced. Di uh, digital Designs ridiculously overpriced. Uh, DC audio overpriced, V2 audio overpriced. Um, compared, it's like it's to say overpriced. It's it's not overpriced as such, but you can get much better perform performance, and you can get basically the same thing, the same end result by paying a lot less from brands that have a much smaller dealer distributor chain markup chain. Um, like some, some of these brands I've mentioned that I've said are overpriced, they make some great stuff, but that doesn't mean that I would recommend it over something else that is like a fraction of the, co of the cost, but that you can get almost the same performance or even may maybe even more performance from. Now, why is this capacitor not coming out? Like I don't have any one favorite brand of, of like audio. Um, I 
will recommend stuff that I believe is, is great value for money. And that can come from a whole range of different brands. Like, for example, I typically have really not liked the brand Inphase. Um, they've made some pretty terrible stuff in the past. Um, however, oh man, I can't, why, what is with this? Is, this? is this glued in or something? What's going on with this one capacitor? Uh, but Inphase are a brand over here in the UK and the subwoofers that they are releasing now, they haven't, you know, they haven't made the subwoofers completely from scratch themselves like Sundown have, but they are insanely good value for money. They are very, very cheap compared to other brands and they perform really, really well for the money. The, uh, Power Drive series, for example, from Inphase, very good. Base Face have made some absolutely horrendous stuff in the past, but their Indy S line of subwoofers are made in the same factory as the Additional Designs Redline stuff, as is the Power Drive from Inphase, and they're really good value for money. Because, again, there's not very much of a markup chain. Inphase is owned by Car Audio Center here in the UK, and they just get the subs made in China and bring them over here and sell them directly to the customer. So there's not much, there's, there's not a lot of people in the chain that need to make money. So, that, so they're actually really, really good value. I would say watch this space on the Carnage uh, subwoofers. I've got one here. Yes, they are very expensive, but I would say, I would say watch this space when it comes to the pricing of those. Um, but uh, then again, like even at the price that the Carnage currently sits at, yeah, what is this? Is this the 15k? Yeah, even at the price that the Carnage currently sits at, it's still a better buy than the same offerings, the same sort of type of offerings from Digital Designs. Like, for example, the Carnage, I would uh, compare that to either a Digital Designs 800 Series 12 or even a 9900 Series 12. Um, and you look up the prices of those, the carnage is still cheaper. Oh dude, Adrian, holy crap, thanks for the 20 buddy, been a while since I've been able to catch a live stream and I love watching these streams Sam. Man, thank you so much Adrian, that is super super generous, that's quite a lot of money but uh, dude, thank you very much indeed. If there's anything I can help you with or anything I can do for you, give me a shout. Oh, I see what I've done. I've, ah, I was heating the wrong bloody part of the board. No way. Fuck. No wonder it wouldn't come out. And no wonder it was like doing the opposite wobble to the bit. Ah, oh, fucking. This is what happens when I chat and repair at the same time. But uh, yeah, honestly, like if you'd asked me like six years ago about what I thought about Inphase, I would have told you stay clear. Don't touch them with a 10 foot barge pole. But in recent years, honestly, the subs, the XT subs, bloody fantastic value for money. You can't go wrong, honestly. I've got a little. Check this, check this little thing out. Check this out. Where, where are we here? Here we go. Look at this. So, this, this is the XT6. This is the XT6 from, uh, from Inphase, okay? Little 6.5 inch woofer. This is very, very affordable in the UK. This is basically a Digital Designs 506, or it might actually have an even slightly bigger motor than the 506. This is basically a Redline 506. Um, or I think B2 have a version as well that might be slightly different because I don't know B2, I haven't seen them. But um, yeah, it's, it's a generic Chinese build house 6, but it's very, very nice. They build them really well. The parameters are great. Motor force is good. Coil gap is quite tight for a mass-produced woofer like this. Soft parts are good. The spider is a good material. It's not going to rip. Um, that's freaking awesome. And the uh, the other sizes of these, the XT8, 10, 12, etc., are also similarly good value. Uh, so yeah. Are, you know, are in phase the uh, the best brand on the market right now? No. Do they make the best products on the market right now? No. But do they make arguably some of the best value products? Like 
for what you get for your money is it is it going to get you the loudest for what you're for what you've spent or is it going to sound the nicest for, for what you've spent probably yes you don't need to spend like a grand on a subwoofer when you can buy a subwoofer for 300 or whatever and basically get the same end result The, um, the most important factors in a, in a car audio system for, for it sounding nice and sounding loud are going to be enclosure, positioning, and power, like power supply. Not, not, um, not amplifier, like brand or anything, I just mean like the amount of power that you've got available and uh, dynamic headroom. If you get the enclosure right, you get the positioning of the speakers and the subwoofer correct, and the acoustic side of it correct, and you have power available, then you can pretty much throw in a whole range of different brands and price levels of equipment and it's all going to sound like pretty good and probably not going to be worth the extra money on something that's like twice as expensive. These, uh, these caps right here are going to be a nice upgrade over the original ones. I wonder why they used bigger value caps in the HD 10K versus the 15K. Maybe the 15K came first, I have no idea. Ah, here we go, H1 Nicholas. Let's just have a quick read of some of this live chat right now. Um, I love Bass Face because they were cheap enough for me to buy my first up at 16. That's another brand, Bass Face, the Indy S12s and the, the Indy S line. Again, super, super good value for money. Not the best subwoofers on the market by any means, but they perform great. A decent build quality, they sound fine, they take a bit of power. And they're really, really affordable. They're, they're more than enough for like 90% of people. And you know, if you've got space and you want to get louder, you can just buy more of them. I think Soundcube just sold out. Yeah, Soundcube is, is one of the brands. Yeah, I don't know the pricing in the States and that, but um, provided that Soundcube is, is relatively affordable. Yeah, Soundcube is, is basically DD Redline stuff. Um, just sold a bit more direct, sold online, sold more direct, so yeah, pretty pretty decent stuff probably most of the time. Um, can't really say much about their amplifiers, um, I know they released the uh, Full Bridge Chinese clones um, of the Sound Digital Circuit, and I'm not a fan of those boards, but even though I'm not a fan of those boards, I think the prices of some of the Sound Cubed amps that they're releasing, like I think they were selling like a 5k for like 200 bucks or something like that, maybe even it was even less, and that's ridiculous. So. Yeah, then I might even be like, yo, you know what? Screw it. <laughs> Get it. It's fine. If it blows, repair it. Learn how to repair it or send it for repair and it's still cheaper over the course of your the time that you've had it than, than something else. Uh, but yes, I, I saw a comment from Nicolas.
What about JBL subs? I haven't seen any of their newer offerings to comment on, I'm afraid, so can't really comment on those. Transformer losses depends on the material used in the ferrites. The volume of the core, bigger core equals more losses. Ha, ah, okay. The magnetic flux used, which is related to the current, switching frequency, and of course, compressing waves. Most ferrites are more efficient um, at elevated temperatures, 80 to 100 Celsius. However, copper loses its in increase with temperature. <coughs> winding geometry could be better on smaller cores due to shorter winding length. That's fair. Awesome information. Thank, thank you, Nicholas, again, buddy, for your insight and, and uh, knowledge there. So, sounds like the smaller cores have more benefits in general than the uh, larger, the single larger ones. So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. How's it going, Daniel? Uh, advantage of running multiple transformers is it allows multiple phases, which never is used in car amplification. I'll just put that out there, but that would be a uh, an advantage. Yes, multiple phases. You can have uh, less ripple on the rails, but that, I've never seen that utilized. Do you recommend buying an oscilloscope off AliExpress? Uh, potentially, yeah. Um, honestly, some of them are going to be fine, especially for just amplified repair work. Um, probably, yeah, probably fine. The, the only thing that would suck is if it's um, the only thing that would suck is if it is um, like very slow to react. You want you want the screen to be fast to react to what you're doing, um, which obviously with the CRT it is. Um, Uh, oh, by the way, I've just been notified that I think there's a little surprise outside my door. I think, I think I've got a little surprise outside my door. Should we have a look and see what it is? Well, what's it going to be? Huh! That's insane! You know, you know they say that Google is listening, or that the AI is listening. You know, I was just talking about wanting a cup of tea. Well, look, look what's just been recommended to me. Look at what's just popped up in my adverts. A freaking cup of tea and a Lin Lindor ball. That is next level, guys. You know, I don't even care. I don't even care that they're listening to me. I don't even care, man. If, if, if this is what, what the result is of, of being spied on and having my data harvest, then that's fine with me, bro. Cheers. This is my mad ting mug. Mad ting. That is freaking fantastic. I love a good Lind Lindor as well. These are these are incredible. Hmm. But yeah. Scope of AliExpress could be fine. Maybe watch some YouTube videos. Lots of people will review uh, equipment off of AliExpress, similar kind of brands. See if you can find any reviews on it, see how it operates on a video. Uh, Neo or ferrite, what floats your boat? Um, well, Neo, just for the old back. <laughs> Although, I say that, my Z4 DDs, even though they're Neo, they are not easy on the back. They're like the heavier subs, some of the heavier subs I've ever picked up. Um, but yeah, I like Neo uh, because it's much lighter, um, which is good for your car and your fuel efficiency and just general performance of your car. Less weight is better. Um, you can still get the performance, obviously, from the higher density, but... The Neo is very delicate to temperature. You don't want to like get a coil cooking at like 400 degrees Celsius in a Neo motor, because the Neo can degrade. The um, the point, the temperature point at which Neo starts to degrade is much lower than ferrite, much lower. Um, so 
Also with Neo, there's less physical mass there to act a bit like a heat sink for the coil. The motor, the, a Neo motor, will, will get up to temperature uh, much quicker than a ferrite motor will do, which does, over time, especially with long demos, affect the cooling performance of the coil. So, yeah, it swings around about us. They would be even heavier. So basically, that, that's, for, that's a funny one. Digital Designs, DD in Oklahoma, actually have a ferrite motor that has the same flux density as one of their older Z3 motors. They built a ferrite motor first, I think. Uh, they, they either built the ferrite motor, motor first, just to see what kind of TS parameters and performance they get from a motor like the Z3, or they built the, the the ferrite motor afterwards just in the experiment to see whether they could get a ferrite motor up to the same um, flux density as the Neo motor. And the thing is a freaking unit. It is the biggest like speaker motor I've ever seen in my life. It's ridiculous. I, I, I'm pretty sure I might even have it on video. I'm not sure if I, if I was allowed to video it. I think there is a video of it on YouTube though. I saw one recently. I think I saw it on YouTube recently. Someone did actually get it on YouTube. This uh, this motor, ferrite motor, that is the same uh, flux strength as the uh, Neo one is ridiculous. <clears throat> uh, I think you're allowed to send links here, Sound by Cloud. I'm pretty sure you are. Uh, loud, loud Fiat made a response on this. His Z4 motor did not degrade in terms of goals. That's really cool to know. Um, okay, cool. Well, I know, I know. With the Z4 motors, the actual Neo part is kind of their little little slugs on the pillars. So then, like, it would be a bit different if the pole piece itself was Neo. I don't know if even that exists. So doesn't the Rockford Fosgate, um, the big twenty-one inch woofer? I'm pretty sure that has a Neo pole piece. Am I right? I could be wrong. Um, but that would maybe be more um, susceptible to getting to ridiculously high temperatures where it would uh, get affected, but. What's up, your Tarrant's HD 10K repair vid from long ago is what convinced me to run their product. Oh, really? Uh, I can't remember what video that was. Um, what, what, what was wrong with that or what repair I did, but yeah, they're really good amps. Uh, okay, uh, yes, we are we are doing capacitors, aren't we, on this? Okay, I think there's a couple more caps I need to put in here, but I think we're going to leave it there for tonight on this amp, not for the stream. We've still got some more some more streaming to do. We're going to look at a Sundown 3K next, I think, and uh, Simo Vo2 will be very happy to, to know that. We can see what's up with that. Uh, but yeah, I think that we'll just we'll leave this one here for tonight. Let's just fit one more. Let's just fit this one more. One, two, three. Let's just fit one more of these over here. And then uh, we'll continue with the uh, HD 15K rebuild once I get the parts in. Uh, and I think what yeah what we're doing is we are ordering from Mausa. So I need to see before I order from Mausa whether there's any parts that I need that you can only get from Mausa or that are hard to get in the UK. I'll have a look and see what they got on there. Um, maybe some 8244BBs actually even because I'm running low on those.
Uh, any thoughts on making your own subwoofer brand? It can't be that hard. I think it is hard. Um, I, I don't think it would be hard to make your own brand and then to have sort of generic uh, drivers uh, assembled from China and have some parts change, you know, have like change the specs of the spider a little bit here and there, um, change the surround profile, change, you know, change a few bits here and there. But to, to do like what Sundown are doing, um, or digital designs are doing in fact, uh, yeah, it's not easy at all. Um, so I think I think the market is kind of saturated with like available subwoofers. Like I've said earlier, the actual subwoofer driver itself is not by any means the most important part of your system. I think there are enough subwoofer drivers on the market that there's going to be one that's going to be perfect for your install and it's going to sound absolutely fine. You don't need me to make another one. Um, there's plenty of decent subs available that are already out there that are, that are really good. You don't need me to make another one. What I do think is needed though is an amplifier that does big power that you can actually rely on. I can't think, like, aside from Paris and getting there, Taramps, um, um, trying to think, trying to think before I say this, um, that probably is, you guys can, you guys can tell me otherwise, but I can't really think of any big amplifiers, like five kilowatts or greater, that you can buy and that you can pretty much abuse as much as you want for 10 years rely on and it just works sounds great continuously not susceptible to vibration damage doesn't randomly blow up while you're low volume at the lights um not susceptible to condensation moisture it's conformal coated um something really beefy that just works um there's not really many of those so that's what i'd like if i'm if i'm going to bring any products to the table it's going to be big high powered modern circuit design, modern architecture amplifiers that are built with my repair knowledge in mind. I know what fails and why things fail and how things fail. So it will be built with that in mind to be as reliable as literally possible. What's your favorite subwoofer brand and why? Like I said earlier, I don't have one really. Um, I, have, I have subwoofers that I love because of what, of what they are, um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend them because they're too expensive. I have a subwoofer brands that I love for the value for money prospect, but I don't necessarily think they're the best subwoofers ever. Um, I do love though the engineering in the Rockford uh, 21 inch. That Those things are just absolutely incredible. Neo motor, the um, injection molded surround to the cone, um, the uh, spider designs on those. The, they're for, like I heard four of them in Australia. I heard four of them in a sixth order. I've never heard a system that plays as low as that yet still continues playing as high as it did with actual accuracy and transient. Like hands down the best system I've ever ever heard was um, that Vito in, in Australia with the, with four of them. Ridiculous. Um, money no object. Those are the subs I would have. The uh, Rockford Fosgate 21s. Absolutely money no object. Uh, what's your opinion on Stetson Force Extreme? Unfortunately, I haven't come across those yet, buddy. So I don't know what their circuit designs are like or anything. I don't have any information on those, I'm afraid. Sorry, man. Have you seen Uralis Sound? That name rings a bell. I'm pretty sure I've seen those drivers on websites and I've looked at the prices and I've been like, what the f... Uh, I'm pretty sure that's one of those brands, isn't it? Uh, oh, 400 volt amps. Yeah, no, I haven't seen them, uh, them unfortunately. But I don't like that these brands are um, cr creating like 400 volt DC supply amplifiers and selling them to the public. No, stop. Nobody should be buying these and installing these. I hate it. I, I, they should be banned, honestly. <clears throat> Oh, I am recording being decently priced. They're uh, based in Russia. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm thinking of something else then. Have you seen that 110 inch sub in a mini cinema? No, I don't think so. Let me have a look. <coughs> 110 inch subwoofer. 
Uh, no, I'm just getting 10 inch. No, Google's not doing me any favours. Send me a send me a link. Send me a broken up link so that it actually appears on here if you can. What do you think of the Rock for Fosgate T fifteen K? Let me remind myself of that. I don't think I've ever seen one in person. Uh fifteen hundred watt four channel. Oh, is this a thing that Steve Mead had in his back of his Taho like years ago? With, with the funky dials on it. It is, isn't it? I have no idea about that amplifier. Never seen one in person. Never seen the guts of it. I don't know how it works. Yeah, I, ha I have nothing on that. Um, although it's very old, so I suggest, I imagine that it is quite outdated now in terms of topology, efficiency, etc. So we have come a long way. You, people forget. People forget that amplifiers are, sem are based on semiconductor technology, right? You look at a computer from the early 2000s and you look at a computer now, or you look at a mobile phone from the early 2000s and you look at a mobile phone now. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. You can't, there, there is no point in using a phone or a computer from the early 2000s. It has nothing about it that is better than something today. And although there are some great old amplifiers, there is a lot to be said for that as well. Like, people forget that the same applies to, to amplifiers, to audio, um, the semiconductor based. So an amplifier from the early 2000s, um, you could recreate that with today's tech at like an eighth, eighth of the size, be more efficient, probably do more power, more reliable, and probably better performance in terms of THD and stuff. You could reproduce that easy, easy, easy. Um, and people forget that, that that advancement has happened across all areas of electronics and not just uh, computing and stuff. Um, I'd buy your amps in a heartbeat. Two years on my Crossfire 16K at 0.5. Um, but it was 3K or oh, 3K. Crossfire 16K. What is that circuit design? Is that, is that, is that a big old Korean jobby? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so th these, are, these are great well, when they work. Um, and yeah, I would expect them to last for... What is it you've had it for? Two years. Yeah, you should get lots more years out of that. When this fails, which it will, this will fail. The output MOSFETs will explode at some point. And when they do, that is going to be a very expensive repair. And it's going to kill the power supply probably along, along with it, unless you get lucky. Right, so I'm done with this tariffs for this evening. Um, we're going to have a look at a Sundown. Talking of Sundown, we're going to look at a Sundown 3K. Have you seen the base garage watt meter? Um, if that's the one that I'm thinking of, is that the one that we've been talking about, Simo Votu? Is that the one that we've been uh, discussing and, and talking to the guy about? Um, if it is, then it looks pretty good, um, but there are, there have been, and I'm, I'm waiting on confirmation that the bugs have been ironed out there, there have been some bugs with it um, when used in peak hold mode on music. Um, the, the three screens don't agree with, it, with each other about the power because the samples for the peak hold are taken at different points uh, for each of the three averages, each, each of the three screens. So when, when you've been playing music and you cycle through the, the screens and look at the amount of power, they all, they all say different values and none of it lines up or makes any sense. Um, so I think those bugs have been sorted and just waiting to test that. Um, but apart from that, yeah, really cool little device. Um, having, you know, a uh, wattage readout um, there right in front of your face is fantastic. Um, although I would probably also look out for the LF Audio one. Um, because uh, from what I've seen of the LF audio stuff, I suspect there will be a lot more 
tech going into the LF audio version, the LF audio watt meter, in terms of refresh rate, in terms of accuracy of the results, and how that they all agree with each other, um, and the firmware and stuff, I suspect will be um, really nice. So I would look at that one as well, probably. All right, where is the Sundown 3K? Uh, it's all the way over there. Okay, bear with me. I'm just going to go grab this Sundown. So, this is, uh, what, what even is this? SAZ33500? I can't remember. The case is over on the um, racks, so not entirely sure. I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, so it's, it's a 3K-ish sundown. Um, and as you can see, it's missing output FETs. Um, what else is it missing? Is it just missing output FETs? I think it's just missing output FETs. Uh, it's also missing a couple of resistors as well for the up, uh, around the output section. So we're going to see what's going on with this one. Um, my good man in the live chat here, uh, Simon Rovo 2, uh, he had this amplifier, and he, like, I think I feel like all you guys here like love, you know, love a bit of amp repair um, and may want to get your hands dirty in it here and there. And um, my guy here, Simon Rovo 2, had a look at this, had a fault, and he was checking out, having a look at it, but. Um, I think it was getting a bit frustrating um, with what was wrong with it, so you just decided to chuck it in over here and um, let me just confirm what's going on. Uh, where is my Allen key for this size? What have I done with it? Got that one. I have no idea. Never mind. Anyway, so let's flip it over. And let's first of all fit some new resistors because we're going to need those. So th these amplifiers, they have um, some big chonky resistors. I think they're 5 watts by the output section here. And I think they're part of the LC network. Uh, sorry, RC network for the output section. So they're just going to go ahead and replace those. But I can't remember what value they are. Uh, Simon, do you remember what value these resistors were by any chance? Um, they might be 47s or they might be 10s or 100s. I honestly can't remember off the top of my head. Hot Skull says, I see Tyramps finally took your advice on new boss amps. Um, what makes you say that? What, what is it about the big boss that you um, saw that, uh, that uh, went by my advice? I can't remember what I said and what they've done differently now. Where's Mike Honda? Good question. I haven't seen him in a while, actually. Uh, 5 watts, 100 ohm. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm not sure if I've got any of those, actually. Did you uh, did you chuck those in with the bag, by any chance? Uh, Jamie, yeah, that's that's... That can be true, but unless you touch stuff that you don't know what about, then you're never going to know about it. There was a point that I touched an amplifier um, to give a repair, and I didn't have a clue about it, and I definitely made it worse. Yeah, there, there's been, like when I was first learning how to repair amps, I think one of the first amps I tried to do a repair on was a Hyphonics 1600 watt or something like that. <laughs> Um, I did some work to it. I'm pretty sure I fitted some MOSFETs from eBay, and um, I, I did did some some stuff to it. 
and then powered it up on my Dell server power supplies, which were, I think I had about uh, 350 amps on tap. And as soon as I hit the remote, every single MOSFET on that board went big up in flames, like big flames, loads of smoke, everything absolutely cooking. Um, <laughs> so, um, and yeah, there's, there's been loads of times back in the day when I was learning how to repair amps where I've made big blunders, messed things up, not been able to repair things, uh, broken traces, pulled vias. That's how you learn. And that's why it's important to, when you're learning how to repair stuff, is to buy broken stuff that then is yours, that then you can mess around with and you, you can break further and learn on, um, rather than taking on customer repairs really, really, really early. Um, see, I, I agree that obviously before you sort of are confident and know and you're confident in your own skills and you know what you're doing, you shouldn't be offering your services um, to other people. But, um, you know, if, if your mate has an amp and he's like, oh, this amp is broken, man, do you, want it, do you want it to mess around with? Then take that opportunity because that's a great learning opportunity to get stuck in on something that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have the ability to play around with. I didn't realize servo sub was a mainstream now. I've, I've seen a few PA um, cabs using servo subs. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a few brands doing them now. The output side looks very similar to the Banda. Uh, I would disagree. <clears throat> About sound cubes, Sky High partially owns them now and they're based out of the same building. Huh, that's why so many sound cube parts became available. Hmm, interesting, that's pretty cool. Uh, Nathan says, hey, love your channel, been watching and learning for three or four years now. Oh, and did you ever finish the audio pack 3K? No, I still haven't done that yet. It's sitting on a, sitting on a, a, on a um, shelf over there. Um, I'll get around to it at some point, but it's like super low in priority. A few years ago, you mentioned Taramp's fans suck suck in lint, which lands on the board and eventually becomes conductive. I appreciate that advice. Uh, yeah, seen that happen a number of times. Um, I usually flip the fans so that they are sucking out of the amp instead of blowing in um, to prevent that from happening. Uh, don't forget trying to glue the leg back on the fet. Oh my days, yes, exactly. When I was in my late teens, my first ever like attempt at fixing a Vibe Monobox 4, I couldn't solder. Uh, I had like a 30 watt soldering iron and it just didn't work. And so I found some conductive glue on eBay um, that's probably good for like small voltage, like messing around with LEDs and stuff. Um, uh, I, had, I found snapped rectifiers in my in my amplifier, and so I tried um, conductive gluing them back to the board, and that didn't didn't end well. So yeah, yeah, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff you can do. Uh, that's why I'm so curious about the Big Boss 8, thinking about doing one per sub at 0.5. Want some headroom for burps, considering the smart technology, uh, but it'll be awesome on demos. Yeah, so basically the Smart 8, the Big Boss 8 and the Smart 8, they're great, provided that you don't ever want to clamp above 8K. Um, a lot of people who have bought these amps and are wanting, are doing big stuff, big, big stuff, um, they would have been, be like, especially wiring to 0.5, they would have actually been better off with a base 8K. 
um, because for certain frequencies, they're actually asking for more than 8K per amplifier when they're wider 0.5. Um, so the yeah, the Big Boss 8 is great if you definitely are absolutely sure that you never want to clamp more than 8K from the amplifier and you're not asking 8K from the amplifier. And in some cases, you actually do if you're running really, really big uh, stuff, especially for burps and competition. For competition use, um, the thing with the, um, the Big Boss 8 and the Smart 8 is they don't really allow you to clip. And when you're in the lanes and you're burping, you actually do want to be in clip. Like, you do. It's louder. Um, the subwoofer overshoots and completes the rest of the sine wave that got clipped off a little bit just because it has momentum. Um, so you do get louder from being in clip at the competition at the, in the lanes. Um, if you're playing clean in the lanes, then you're just sandbagging and it's kind of pointless. Um, so, yeah. They're not great for competition use, but they're great for daily and for demoing, provided you don't want to clamp over 8K. Uh, so let's see if I've got any. Um, let's see if I've got any 100, 100 ohm. Uh, 5 watt resistors. I've got a feeling I might not have. This is not the sort of thing that usually fails, so I don't tend to keep a lot of stock of stuff that doesn't normally fail. Oops, my hat cam has come disconnected. One sec, let's plug that back in. Deactivate activator. There we go. The forbidden tub of resistors, guys. Uh, so I've got some 47s, but I don't know if I've got any, ah here we go, 100 watt 5, 100, sorry, 100 ohm 5 watt, there's one. Is that going to be another? No, that's a 47. That's a 47. There we go, yes, I do have two. Excellent, what are the chances? I honestly didn't think I was gonna have those, but uh, jokes, I do, I do have them. Brilliant. All right, so this this resistor pad here, this, this location where this resistor was, looks like it's, um definitely been arcing so there's been like a poor connection there at some point perhaps so let's grab let's grab something to kind of scratch away at that and just have a little deeper look at that so what have you been arcing on i've got a trace on the top of the board there perhaps let's have a look and see what that connects to Right, so we have a negative rail on one side. I oh, know, is it negative rail? No, it's not. It's, um, all right, we have a low side drain on one side. This is, this is the other side. So a low side drain on one side. So that's basically class D PWM, class D switching on one side. And then on the other side, that looks a bit green actually, almost as if there's been a bit of uh, moisture sitting under there. I wonder whether that's what's happened or whether when, whether you've got a bit of condensation um, has been has kind of caused a bit of moisture build up underneath these resistors. Kind of caused it to arc a little bit there. These caps look a little bit wobbly. I think these caps have been replaced at some point, um, and they're sick because they're a bit bigger in size. Yeah, no, there has been moisture. I okay, guess so you can see that green there. Bit of condensation or moisture there. So I want to check that that trace is still intact, actually. That leads to that capacitor there. Okay. It does still look intact, it just looks a little bit greeny on the top there. Uh, and then this trace doesn't lead to that, to this resistor. The other side of this resistor, where does the other side of this resistor lead to? 
uh, leads to this smaller little film capacitor. There's a little film cap in there you can see. And then on the other side of that film cap probably goes to the drive circuit, possibly for the uh, high side uh, bootstrap or something like that. Could, or could be, um, could be a filter, just a, an RC. Um, we also have some traces under, under this little black goop as well that look like... Uh, yeah, actually, you know what? This trace doesn't look that great. I wonder whether this black glue is like gone bad, like you see with a lot of home amps. I don't really see a lot of that in car amps, to be honest. Um, the, the black glue that they tend to use in car amps is either different makeup or the environment's just different. You don't really tend to see a lot of this like you do in home amps and plate amplifiers and stuff. But um, yeah, that trace doesn't look amazing either, to be honest. Okay, but that is all intact. That's going off underneath that capacitor there. Okay, let's just check this side where it's uh, got a bit holy over here. Now, actually, yeah, that trace has disappeared. There we go. So, we've got uh, this. Look, look at that. Fuck. The trace leading to that capacitor has disappeared. See this? Got this trace here. That's supposed to connect to this trace here from this capacitor so again we've got the black stuff it looks a little bit crispy here but underneath there looks okay to be fair so I wonder whether it's yeah just a bit of condensation a bit of moisture has caused that trace to to disappear. So with the resistor in place, obviously un underneath the resistor is not conductive by any means. So we can we can rebuild that trace and then just plonk the resistor on top to kind of hold it down, and we should be fine. You just want to make sure that the we don't um, short this trace rebuild to whatever this plane is here. Uh, is that plane going to be like output or negative rail or positive rail perhaps? Go into anything. There's another trace there actually that's that's disconnected. So there, there's a trace. There's a trace there that's disconnected. And then what about the other one? The other one, is that on the other side of the board. The other trace is on the other side of the PCB, so that's fine. So it's just the trace coming off of that leg there. Actually, no, both. I know it's, it's both of them. Fuck. It's both of them. Look, it's very difficult because I need this. The angle that this this needs to be at is kind of kind of janky, but we've got a trace here for this little film capacitor, this little yellow one that's kind of a bit blackened here. Let's see if we can get that cleaned up a little bit. The capacitor itself will be fine. It's just covered in a bit of soot from the arcing that's been going on here. So we've got this trace here that's from the little film cap. And that appears to have gone there. But then also there's a trace from this larger capacitor seems to maybe go along here where this big hole is in the board now sorry for getting my head in the way it's very difficult to kind of see what I'm doing and film it at the same time I did that where did that connect to then Because on the other side of the board, that sort of trace that goes under the resistor does look like it's for that cap. Does 
doesn't really matter, like we can just connect it up, we can just use a multimeter and confirm where it's supposed to connect to and just run a jumper wire somewhere else, but um, I just kind of want to see where all the traces were originally supposed to be going, so this large cap, we go under there, that is this big trace here, and then that one, three. Trace is going under that capacitor, and that little cap goes to the resistor. Okay, so let's have a look on the other side of the board. So let's see whether we still have continuity from this little cap, which is the little yellow one. Let's see if we still have continuity to any of the resistor pads. No, we don't. Okay, so that trace is broken to the resistor pad. There's a via here. See that via? That would have supposed to have gone up and probably connected to connected to here. Ah, here we go. There is another trace hiding right there. There's another trace hiding right there. I think this one. Is there another trace hiding right there? I thought there was. There should be the veers on that side. So there should have been a veer. There should have been a veer right here where this hole is. And then there should have been a trace that went to this little yellow capacitor. But what's weird is I can't see it jumping over this trace here. So you see this trace, that this trace looks like it was just broken there. But if there's a via here, that should have gone. There should be another trace somewhere. Maybe that's the one that goes over this side here. Ah, uh, I know what it is. Wait, that looks like... How is that connected? <laughs> that big capacitor is connected to this trace, even though the trace is fully open. What? Damn, I wish I had a picture of what this was supposed to look like. Because this trace looks like it just connects there, but it might not. This trace might have just gone straight to this via or to the or to here, and this trace might have gone through there, around there to this other side. It's very confusing. I'm going to remove this capacitor to make it a little bit easier to see what's going on over there. So while this cap's removed, we can also obviously check that it's still in spec. I suspect it is. It's just covered in a bit of uh, a bit of soot from um, the arcing that was going on nearby. Get a visual on this. Let's clean this up a little bit. Let's get a better visual here. Okay, right. So it is clear that there was supposed to be a trace going up to this capacitor along this pathway that has disappeared, that has vanished. And we don't know where that was supposed to connect to. It might have needed to connect to here, it might have gone along to here. We're not entirely sure, but we should be able to take reference from the other side of the board where this is all still intact, of course. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and remove the capacitor from the other side of the board as well, just to make things a little easier to see again. So let's just uh, lift this one off here. 
we can just drop these back in in a matter of seconds once we're all finished being a bit of a pain in the ass to get out this cup it's kind of uh, created a very high thermal mass solar ball on the top of the legs come on come on out you come there we go there we go right so on the good side of the amp we have, yeah, still a lot of green crap over this side, isn't there? There's definitely been some moisture sitting over here. Not good. Eat the board there. So the large capacitor does that have any continuity to the big resistor? No, it doesn't. Okay, not on this side. Does it have any continuity to the small capacitor? No, it doesn't. Okay, the resistor, the big resistor, does have continuity to the small film capacitor. Cool, that's good. So what does the big capacitor have continuity to. We can see a trace here goes underneath this large capacitor. Um, <clears throat> so maybe it goes to negative rail. There we go. We have continuity to negative rail there. So let's check. Do we have continuity to negative rail also on this one? Uh, yes, we do. Which is a little confusing because it looks like there was supposed to be a trace going there, but maybe there wasn't. Maybe that is just where the kind of corrosion happened, but it does look like it's supposed to go towards negative rail though. Maybe this is um, negative rail. Maybe it's uh, the 12 volt supply. Is there a trace on the bottom? Yeah, we do have a trace on the bottom for that one and this one, to be honest. But it really does look like a trace was supposed to go off that way, but maybe not. Um, now this little this little capacitor here, this little film cap, that is supposed to have continuity to the big resistor. Now which side of the big resistor is it supposed to have continuity to? Let's check. It's supposed to have continuity to this side, which is, let's see, what is that? Is that connected to anywhere else on the board? Just to kind of con confirm with ourselves, it doesn't look like it is. So we don't have con continuity anywhere else on the board, but the other side of the resistor is low side drain. So let's confirm which side of this resistor is low side drain. That's that side. So this side here is supposed to be connected to this little film cap. Okay, fantastic stuff. So then where the heck does this trace go? And where the heck was that supposed to be connected to? Because if this trace went into the via for this, which is somewhere under here in this burned crap. Let's see if we can find it. There it is. There's the via. So maybe the, ah, the, yeah, this trace passed alongside. Maybe it did connect to there, you know? Yeah, it looks like it did. Okay, I think we have sussed it. So we need to run. <laughs> I might actually drill a little hole in the board here, actually. I think we're going to drill a hole in the board, guys, just to make life a little bit easier for us. This has turned out to be a little bit more in-depth. 
So we need to drill a little hole where this veer is because that's no longer on the top of the board. So let's grab our drill and drill a little hole. Yeah, so Simon, the amplifier will only be in protect if one of the uh, following um, you know, issues are satisfied, and that is, so the amplifier will be in protect if it detects DC offset of the speaker terminals, and you're not going to have DC offset of the speaker terminals without any output MOSFETs fitted, so it won't be in protect because of that. The other reason it'll be in protect is, where, is if um, the voltage on the power terminals is below or above a certain threshold, which you were feeding it probably about 12 volts or whatever, so it won't have been in protect for that. Another reason it can be protected is overcurrent on the output section. Well, you haven't got any output effects fitted, so not going to be that. Um, other reason it can be protected is thermal, which it obviously wasn't overheating because on your bench, so yeah, it wouldn't be protect protect for that either. So yeah, there was no reason for the amp to be in protect per se. Okay, fantastic. So we just run a little, a little wire through there. Ah, oh, yes, and you can see where that hole has come up. It's actually come up with enough space for this trace to have run through. So yeah, interesante. Uh, have you got fiberglass pens, Sam? No, I do not. What is this fiberglass pens? Is that like for covering these kinds of traces and stuff after you finish doing a repair on them? Because if so, that would be good to look into. Cutters now, there we go. Uh, it's like a little scrubber. Oh, cool. Um, that would be really useful because, yeah, that would allow you to kind of scrub away at the traces. Um, yeah, I'll check that out. Thank you very much for that tip. I'll have a look and see if I can grab some. Right, so that's that trace sorted. Now we also need another one that goes from here to here. Vale, vale, vale. Although, yeah, we're going to have to probably wrap around there, uh, make a little circle to go around the uh, capacitor leg. Because obviously there's no there's no trace there for the cap. Well, there is a trace there for the cap leg, but it's like there's not much left of it. Um, so I'm probably just going to do a little, like a little circle around. Um, if I can remember the uh, pliers here, so I can wrap around the cap leg or make a little hook maybe, and then solder from the top of the board. Okay. 
So we'll go on like that, I think. Yes, very nice. And then I'm just going to put my little spiky boy in there to hold it steady. And then pull that round under the resistor where the trace will have originally gone. And we can just solder it to that pad there. Okay, let's grab the iron. Okay, nice. Now let's get the capacitor back. Yo, what happened to my, uh, wait, what happened to this one? What's come up? It's come up big time. Here we go. Uh, so now let's get the capacitor back and uh, drop that in and get that soldered to the, the little loop on that on that wire that we've made. Are you using leaded solder? Yes, we are using 6040. I refuse to use anything else because it sucks. Now I think, I think on these caps, the little black mark here was uh, negative, um, but these aren't the most obvious. Maybe they're, maybe they're bipolar, non-polarized. Non um, can anyone scroll back in the stream and just check which, which, <laughs> which way round they were in? I think because obviously the legs are cut, so I don't have one leg longer than the other, but I think the little black mark should be negative. That's the way it usually works. But I just want to don't want to fit them in for it to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Right now, I need to be able to solder. See, nah, see, nah. That's 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 not actually gone in the hole, is it? Maybe I'll grab the other one. This is some fiddly stuff, swear down. There we go. Excellent. All right. Now what I'm going to do is set the height of that with the other one and the, and bring it up a little bit so that I've got room to get my soldering iron in from the other side, so I can solder to that top trace that we've just rebuilt.
the solder might have actually just flowed through then. Let's have a look and see if we can see from the top of the board. Is that little thing that we've just made soldered to that capacitor? Oh nice, it is, it flowed through, excellent. So that's all good and done. So, move that over a little bit. Now we've got to solder that resistor in. go black square is negative thank you Jamie appreciate you buddy thanks for that So if we should do Big Boss 8 on each of your 15s for the Bants. Uh, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Although the uh, power supply system in the van is stock alternator, just with four AGMs. It's not that beefy. <laughs> um, but um, the problem is, we could do that. But the problem is, um, is that the, um, the limiting factor in my van for power, the thing that, the, the thing that uh, makes, prevents me from being able to run more power in the van, is actually woofer excursion. Sucks. Like the enclosure is not not perfect for my DDZ4s. It's it's a bit too bit too big, perhaps. But there's not enough port area for sure. There's not enough port area. So I reached mechanical excursion limit before I reached the limits of my vehicle supply in the van. Um, so yeah, in order to um, to benefit from more power or like you know big amps and ting, I would have to. Um, make some box changes which is not something that I like doing I, I don't like fabrication woodwork and that like not not in not on that scale um, unfortunately so it's either going to be an expensive trip to hardwood acoustics to get box mods done and uh, probably a long wait uh, I've got a Mercedes Vito uh, which you should be able to see in some of my videos actually uh, I'm, the most recent video I made of the Vito is a silly video that I made with my good friend Matthew um, which is called If Bear Vids Was Actually Loud in 2008. And so what I did is I took uh, my old Kodak camera from back in the day, that I still have, I took that and recorded a kind of Realm of Excursion style uh, bass video um, last year with the van, with that old camera, and made it look like an old bass demo video. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Uh, so you can, yeah, the, 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 that's the most recent footage of the van. Okay, so I think we've made repairs to that part of the circuit. So now let's just quickly power it up. Um, I am at the end of the stream now. It's half ten, which is when we're going to be ending the stream. But I do just want to power it up and see what the drive circuit is saying on this bad boy. Um, we've no idea what the health condition of the drive circuit is on this amp. So um, the driver board itself looks a little bit sus, not going to lie. Um, especially around the uh, PWM generation with the op amp and ting. Drive ICs look okay. Um, all right, let's take a multimeter and let's just do a quick check of diode mode readings between sides because this is essentially two amplifiers or two channels on the same PCB that parallel together. So let's see what we got on this side. Uh, open. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Oh, hang on a minute. That's because that gate resistor is actually floating there. So, okay, here we go. So we've got set uh, multimeter cam is obviously not working because it never bloody is. Yeah, 
and it's actually not even being recognised. Oh, there we go. There it is. There we go. Um, so we have. Seventeen sixty two one way round and we have so we've got five seventy three. So five seventy three on the high side there uh, and five eighteen or no, five sixty seven on the low side. So we're looking for the same readings on the other side of the board. And it jumps up to five sixty eight. So if we go over on the other side now. Uh oh, that's uh, oh wait hang on, no that is that is that is fine. Um, nothing that way round. It's interesting. Okay, we've got nothing again here. Is this gate resistor open? No. So this is actually, I think, a high side. We've got nothing on the multimeter there. It's really strange. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, so there's problem that side. And then, ooh, 200. 200 both ways round, that's not what you want to see. That's probably going to be a dead drive, I see. Yep. Uh, the um, bootstrap uh, supply resistor is intact that side and intact that side. But yeah, this side's forking forked. So we need a couple new drive ICs on the driver card there. Um, but that should maybe be it. Um, we can do that probably tomorrow, I suspect. So guys, hope you found that interesting. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to power this one up this evening, but it is my curfew for this evening. We're done. Oh, my um, 16, my 18650s are charged. These are basically, look, look at this. I have a Dyson vacuum cleaner that, um, the battery just gave up really, it doesn't hold charge anymore, you charge it fully and then you try and use it and the vacuum cleaner just turns on and off, on and off. So I suspected the cells had just ran out. Um, so I've got a good friend who lives nearby who has a bunch of these um, tall batteries uh, for the, you know, he's like tools for his workshop um, and they use 18650s as well and he's got a bunch of these that were kind of like low or didn't charge anymore so I'm just kind of seeing whether I can find any good cells from any of those um, so uh, don't worry I'm never leaving these charging unattended it's always while I'm sitting right next to them uh, so we can you know sort anything out if anything goes wrong while they're charging but um, yeah I'm trying to, trying to get some good cells out of these um, to replace my Dyson handheld vacuum cleaner batteries so that's good fun, just charging all those up. Uh, what happened in the TL494 retrofit? So that, actually let me just show you real quick, if I can. The TL494 retrofit. Uh, that went well. That currently looks like that. Um, yes, we have retrofit. We have it working with pin four, dead time con duty cycle control is working. Uh, we used the um, PWM0 line, we used PWM0 from the MCU and we sent that into a transistor with an RC network uh, as Michael suggested and after tweaking around with some resistor values I got that working beautifully. So yes, that is really, really almost ready to go. I just need to fit some new uh, power supply drive drivers, power supply drive ICs and then it should be ready to go for testing, which is good fun. Uh, but yeah, um, half ten already. No, it's big What van you got? Yeah. So yeah, basically awesome. Thanks for joining me, guys. Hope you had a good one, and we'll catch you a little bit later on this week for another stream. Um, have a great week, and see you next.